Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of that song would be true. I pray that we would truly want to know you more. I pray that each of us would come before you today with surrendered hearts, seeking to know the one true God. For you are the very purpose of our life, and without you there's really no meaning, no value whatsoever. And so, Lord, I pray that you would draw those who do not know you to yourself. And for those of us who do know you, I pray that you would help us to grow in our relationship with you. Remind us that we are not called to exalt ourselves. We are not called to promote our own agendas. We are called to exalt Christ. We are called to promote your agenda. We are servants. And I bow this day merely as a servant, one who's not even worthy to untie the sandals of Jesus. But I'm so thankful that you have chosen to use me. Now use me, I pray, for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, as we continue on working our way through the Gospel of Mark, uh, talking about this idea of servanthood. I'm preaching a series entitled, Living to Serve Like Jesus. Living to Serve Like Jesus. Some of you may have noticed the sign this week as you were driving by, or perhaps when you came into church this morning, or looked on your bulletin, and you saw that the subtitle for this morning's message is, The Blessings of Being Last. The Blessing of Being Last. Now, I wonder how many people drove by our church this week and thought, boy, that's a sermon I don't want to hear. <laughs> who wants to be, I mean, uh, is, I mean, yeah, who wants to be last? I mean, is that a church of underachievers? <laughs> is, that, is that a church that is failing to pursue excellence? The blessing of being last. Perhaps some of you even thought that. Well, what's our pastor preaching on? I teach my children they need to be first. And now here's a sermon on the blessing of being last. Well, I'd like to invite you to look at Mark chapter 9. And we're going to read there verse 30 through 41. And before this message is over with, you'll see where I'm coming from. So in Mark chapter 9, verse 30, it says, Then they left that place, and they made their way through Galilee. But he did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. When they came to Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. Because on the way, they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone wants to be first... He must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a child and had him stand among them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Don't stop him, Jesus said, because there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name who can soon after toward or soon afterward speak evil of me. For whatever is not against us, or whoever is not against us, is for us. 
And whoever gives a cup of water to drink because of my name, since you belong to Christ, I assure you, he will never, listen to that, even if you give a cup of cold water in his name, he says, I assure you, you will never lose your reward. Well, the drive to become famous is a high value in our culture. I think that you would all agree. As a matter of fact, in a 2014 speech, New York Times columnist David Brooks says this, and I quote, Fame used to be a low value. Now fame is the second most desired thing in young people. They did a study and they asked, would you rather be president of Harvard or Justin Bieber's personal assistant or another celebrity? Three, let me make sure I get it right. Yeah, and by three to one, they chose to be a personal assistant of some celebrity rather than be the president of Harvard. Brian Robbins, whose company creates YouTube channels for teenagers, told the New Yorker, when you speak to kids, the number one thing they want to be is famous. They don't even know why or what for. They just want to be famous. It doesn't take a lot to prove this. I mean, in our day of social media, it's a big thing to have a large amount of followers on Twitter. As a matter of fact, if you reach such a status, they put a little blue, is it a check or something out beside your, put a little blue check out beside your name to let you know, to let everybody know that what? You're famous, you're popular. This person has a lot of followers. Or perhaps there's even a comparison about how many followers you have on Facebook. I'll take it even a step further. Recently in our culture, steroid use has become predominant. Many baseball players have been exposed for steroid use. Football players, boxers, fighters, they've all been exposed for their steroid use. Cyclists. Why? Why do we place such emphasis on how many followers we have on Twitter or how many followers we have or friends we have on Facebook or steroid use? It's because we live in a culture that desires to be first. No one wants to be last. No one wants to be mediocre. Everyone wants to be the best. Everyone wants to be popular and famous and powerful and all this is driven by one thing pride pride and by the by the way don't say well this is not about me because I don't have a Twitter account or this is not about me because I'm not on Facebook Or this is not about me because I don't desire to be powerful or prestigious or popular. It's not about me. So it, I, 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 sh I didn't even have to come today. It's, it's, this message is for all those other people. Let me assure you that is a prideful statement. <laughs> Can I say this morning that pride is something that we all struggle with? By nature, we love to exalt ourselves. Remember that. That according to Scripture, by nature, we are sinful. Paul even tells us in Romans chapter 3, there's none who does good. No, not one. There are none who are righteous for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, by nature, we are self-absorbed. We are self 
promoting. We want things done our way. As a matter of fact, if you look perhaps where you work, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find people who are jockeying for positions. As a matter of fact, our culture places great emphasis upon someone who leads a corporation. We hold those people in, in an honor of prestige. And that even takes place in the church. I believe that we ought to respect our pastor. I mean, Paul, I mean, the scripture tells us to honor those who labor among you. So I, I do believe that there's a, there is a respect that needs to be given to the pastoral office. And uh, I, I believe that. I believe that's biblical. But I'm a servant. I'm, I'm not the CEO of a corporation. As a matter of fact, most of you know, and I don't have anything against this, but I'm talking about in pastoral ministry, most, most of you know that hopefully by the grace of God, I'll be graduating with my doctorate here in a few months. And uh, many of you have said, well, are we going to have to start calling you doctor? And my, you know what my answer is? You know what my, you know what my favorite title is? Pastor. Pastor. Because that's the title that, that God gives me. And, and it reminds me of who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm a pastor. I'm here to shepherd the flock. I'm here, I'm here to serve. To serve. But do I struggle with pride? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I struggle with pride. So do you. Because pride, pride comes natural. Humility doesn't. Pride does. It was true of Jesus' disciples. As we looked at this passage of Scripture we just read, here's Jesus talking about the gospel. I mean, he's talking about how he's going to be betrayed and going to be crucified and how he's going to rise from the dead. And what are they talking about? Which one of them is going to be the greatest? The disciples, they, they struggle with being self-absorbed and being prideful just like, just like we do. So here we find ourselves in the middle of Jesus' great discourse on discipleship. Jesus has had a public ministry. He's been in the northern region of, of Galilee and he's been, he's been preaching and he's been ministering and he's been serving. But now Jesus' public ministry is coming to an end and he's making his way down towards the southern part of the Sea of Galilee, down towards Capernaum, and he's beginning to focus primarily on his disciples. He's going to spend time discipling them and preparing them and teaching them for his upcoming crucifixion. And so the Bible says there, as we just read, that in verse 30, they left the place and they made their way through Galilee, but he did not want anyone to know it. Why? Because he's no longer dealing with the crowds. Now he's teaching his disciples, and he, he wants time alone with them. He wants time to teach them because it won't be long, and he's going to be crucified. You see, he's making his way down towards Jerusalem. His heart is set like flint to go to Jerusalem. His desire is to obey the will of God. And Jesus Christ knows that without a shadow of a doubt that all that awaits him in Jerusalem is mocking and suffering and brutality and ultimately crucifixion. And it, it is of the utmost importance that he prepares his disciples for this event. 
And so he gets off by himself. He doesn't want the crowds to know so that he can spend time with them. And in verse 31, we see what he's teaching them. He was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise three days later. Verse 32, but they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Why did they not understand? This isn't the first time that they heard this. Why is it that they don't understand? Here's why they don't understand. Because their culture is just like our culture. The idea of a crucified Messiah did not fit in their theology. It didn't make sense. The Messiah is the chief leader in their minds. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to overthrow Rome and he's going to set up his kingdom here on earth and he is coming to rule and to reign. Now Christ will one day, but they expected that to happen at his first coming. And so the idea of a servant Messiah, a suffering Messiah, a crucified Messiah just did not make sense to them. Because they knew Jesus Christ was their leader, but all the examples they had of leadership up to this point came from the Pharisees and the scribes. So what did the disciples think about leaders? Well, they were to dress a certain way. They were to act a certain way. They had the place of honor at the table. They received all the prestige. What they commanded people were to do. People moved out of their way when they were walking down the streets. That was their idea of, of leadership. But it stands in contradiction to true biblical leadership. True leadership is not about being self-absorbed. It's not a dictatorship. True leadership is being a servant. Jesus himself said, if you'll recall, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give my life as a ransom for many. So if we're going to live this life of servanthood and follow the example of Jesus, it's going to take something. What's it going to take? It's going to take a virtue that stands in opposition to pride, and it's the virtue of humility. Pride comes natural to us. Humility does not come natural. Therefore, humility is something that we are to seek. It is something that we are to... Pray for. In this passage of Scripture, obviously, Jesus is turning the value system of the world upside down. This is radical. This is mind blowing to them. <laughs> Why would the disciples even be arguing about who is the greatest? Well, you'll, re you'll remember if you just look back at your Bibles, what was the event that occurred right before this? It was the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus went up on the mountain and he was transfigured and Moses and Elijah was there with him. And Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain and they saw his glory. They saw his transfiguration. And so I'm sure the other disciples, they came down and their chests were poked out, right? We've been with Jesus up on the mountain of transfiguration. We saw his glory. We must be greater than you. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to be the greatest, not you. And so here's this argument. In the midst of Jesus talking about the gospel, in the midst of Jesus teaching them about his coming, coming crucifixion, they are arguing with one another about who is the greatest. Full of pride, and they lacked humility. We should not shake our head and say, oh, these disciples, here they go again. For we are no different. If we are going to walk the road of true greatness, are you hearing me? Then we have to walk the path less traveled. And it's the path of humility. 
the road to greatness is clothed or paved with humility. I love what Andrew Murray says in his book on humility. He says this, Humility is not so much a virtue along with others, but it is the root of all virtues. <laughs> humility is to, be the very, is to be the very foundation of your life. I believe that humility was the foundational virtue in the life of Christ. You'll recall what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, and I quote, starting in verse 5. He said, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant and being made into the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So if we recall what Paul said in that Philippians 2, 2 passage. He said, have this mind in you. Your mind should be the same as Jesus. That should be your mindset. Your life should reflect the life of Jesus. And what did Paul tell us? That he, he did not consider himself to be great, but he did what? He humbled himself and became a servant. That's what we need in churches today. That's what we need in families today, in marriages today. That's what we need among young people today. It's not a desire to seek to be famous or seek power or prestige. But we ought to seek what is truly great in the eyes of God, and that is humility. Dying to myself, taking up my cross, and following Him. Think about it. Here's Jesus talking about his coming crucifixion, and all they're concerned about is who is the greatest. Christ has already come, church. He's already been crucified, he's been buried, and he's risen from the dead. And we stand right now, we stand knowing with absolute certainty that Christ is coming again. So in the midst of Christ coming, how dare we seek to promote ourselves? So, humility is something that we ought to see, because I told you before, Jesus and his disciples, they arrived in Capernaum. This will be their last visit. If you back up to chapter 8, we're not going to look there, but just for your own reference, Jesus has already taught them about self-denial in chapter 8, verse 34. He's already told them they need to deny themselves. <laughs> He's already told them it's not about them. As a matter of fact, in chapter 8, verse 35, Jesus tells them that if you want to save your life, you've got to be willing to what? Lose it. <laughs> Die to yourself. Realize that it's not about you. Take up your cross and follow me. There is no place in biblical Christianity for us to be self-absorbed. For us to seek to promote ourselves. Sadly, what do we know about the disciples? They were deaf to what Christ was teaching, weren't they? Chapter 8, verse 34. It's not about you. Verse 35, it's not about you. <laughs> Come to chapter 9, what are they saying? It's all about us. Have we become deaf? Have you become deaf to the clear teaching of Scripture? Maybe your first response is no. Let me ask you, take a look at your marriage right quick. Take a look. 
husband and wife, are you arguing and bickering and having a hard time getting along with one another? You want me to tell you why? Pride. The reason you can't get along and the reason you're arguing and bickering is because you're trying to put yourself before her or she's trying to put herself before you. There's no, there's no, there's no place for that. There's no time for that. If the world is lost, it needs to hear the gospel, Christ is coming, and it is vitally important that we die to ourselves and we live this life of, of servanthood. So what's it going to take? I want to look at four things briefly. I'm just going to walk through these points. Four things, because they're really practical. And I don't think I need to spend a long time, a lot of time on them. Four things that are important as it relates to humility. First is very simple. You want to live this life of humble servanthood? Put other people first. Put other people first. Humility cultivates unity, whereas pride destroys unity. Are you hearing that? Let me say it again. Put other people first. Why? Because humility cultivates unity, whereas pride destroys unity. Danny Aiken, the president of Southeastern Seminary, says that there are three things that a believer must overcome. And I quote, you must overcome the desire for pride. You must overcome the desire for position. And you must overcome the desire for prominence. And what I love about it, these are the very things that the disciples were failing to overcome. They failed to overcome pride. Why? Because they're arguing amongst themselves about who is the greatest. And they know it's wrong because when Jesus questions them about it, what do they do? They, they don't say anything. Why? Because they're full of shame. We look there at our Bibles, we see in verse 30, the second, last part of verse 33, Jesus says, what are you arguing about? But they were silent because on the way they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and he said to them, if any of you wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus is saying, listen, you want to be great? Then you need to overcome the desire for pride. You want to be great? Then you need to overcome the desire for position. You want to be great, then you need to overcome the desire for prominence. Now, all of, most of you know me, and you know that I'm not talking about, I, I believe that we ought to seek to better ourselves, and, and there's nothing wrong with, uh, with ch- taking a job promotion when it's offered and, and things like that. I, I'm t- I, I think we ought to pursue excellence in all things. But there's the difference between being faithful. I'm doing my job just to be faithful, and as a result... You're blessed with a promotion. That's one thing. It's another thing that I'm going to step on everybody along the way and I'm going to spend my days jockeying for position. That's called brown nosing. Okay? I worked with a guy in the oil field and when the bosses weren't around, he was the laziest guy on the face of the earth, I think. But when the boss would come, he would, he would get to work, and, he, and, and the boss would always talk about, why don't y'all work like him? Why don't y'all work like him? Why did he do it? Not because he was a faithful employee. Why did he do it? Because he was just jockeying for position. Those who are faithful, they, they serve no matter who's around. Reminds me of a young... A young student who taught me a valuable lesson when I first started out in the youth, minute, youth as a youth pastor. I took our, our youth to camp, and, and uh, we were getting ready to leave the last day of camp. And, and the camp, the, uh, the, the uh, volunteers who worked there at the camp had the responsibility of coming into our dorm and cleaning the toilet. I want to tell you something. If you've ever seen a toilet at camp after a bunch of teenage boys have been there for a week, it is horrific, Okay. And so this guy's in there, he's on his hands and knees, he's cleaning the toilet, and I walk in, I say, man, how'd you get stuck with this job? You know what he said to me? He said, I'm doing it for the Lord. Right? Doing it for the Lord. So let me just say, we've got to overcome this pride thing. 
And we can't do it ourselves. We've got to have the Lord. You've got you to keep close to him. You know what the world's philosophy is? The world's philosophy is that you are great if other people are working for you. That's the world's philosophy. You know what Jesus' philosophy is? You are great if you're serving others. Plato, one of the great philosophers, he said this, How can any man be happy when he has to serve someone else? Plato thought it was an absolute impossibility for a person to be happy if they had to serve somebody. Jesus says the only way you'll really be happy is if you serve somebody. So Jesus takes the whole thought process of the world and he turns it upside down. That's what Jesus is teaching his disciples there. He says, listen, you need to put other people before yourself. If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and a servant of all. Jesus further not only teaches this principle, but now he's going to illustrate what he means. You see, then he takes a child and he had him stand among them and taking the child in his arms. He says, whoever welcomes a little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, not only welcomes me, but welcomes him who sent me. You don't just welcome me, you welcome the Father. Which brings me to my second point. We've got to avoid all prejudice. Put other people first. Avoid all prejudice. What do we know about a child in this culture? Well, they were considered to be the, the lowly, the meek, the helpless. And Jesus is saying, this is the type of servant that I want you to be. I want you to be a humble servant, just like this child. I want you to be lowly. I want you to be meek. I want you to be gentle. Isn't that what Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the pure in heart. So Jesus says, I want you to be like this child. Your servanthood needs to be like this child. You need to be humble. You need to be lowly. You need to be meek. But it also demonstrates you, you need to be willing to serve everybody. You need to receive this child. And by the way, when you serve this child, you, the child can't do anything else for you in return, can they? If we're not careful, we'll only serve people who we think can do something for us. That's not what it means to serve like a child. We need to be meek. We need to be lowly. We need to be humble. We need to be gentle. And we need to avoid all prejudice and be willing to serve all people. Whether it's a child or a senior adult. Whether they've got white skin or black skin. Whether they believe our values or don't believe our values. You say, well, pastor, if I serve them, am I condoning what they're doing? No, you're not. If I walk up to someone and I say, boy, howdy, I know you're living this ungodly lifestyle. I know you're living this lifestyle, and I want you to know that it's okay with me. We all love Jesus. Now, let me give you a cup of water. Now, you, th that's a way of condoning someone's sin. But if I just come to somebody and I say, hey, I want to give you a cup of water in Jesus' name. A great illustration of this truth was blasted all over social media here recently when a group of KKK members, the Ku Klux Klan, were, had a rally in South Carolina. And one of the members with a swastika on his shirt became overcome by the heat and he had to be taken to get water. And he had, to be, he had to be taken to sit in the shade. Guess who took him? A black police officer. It went viral all over social media. And here's this black police officer helping this KKK member to a cool place in order to get him a drink of water. <laughs> That's what it means to be a servant of the Lord. To put all prejudice aside and say that I am here to serve you in the name of of Jesus. You want to be a servant? Serve like Jesus? Put other people before yourself. And avoid all prejudice. Now, uh, 
He goes on to explain this for us even further. If you look in verse 38, John thought he was doing a good thing. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. He wasn't a part of our clique. We stopped him, Jesus, and Jesus said, Don't stop him. You need to stop. He says, because there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name who can soon after speak evil of me. The thing you need to notice is this. Jesus says that they do it in my name. So they're under the authority of God. It's obvious that God's work is at, is at place, and they're doing it in the name of Jesus. He says, don't be prejudiced towards those people. What does that look like in our culture? We've already talked about skin color and, and different values, but that shouldn't hinder us from serving people in the name of Jesus, okay? And by serving someone in the name of Jesus doesn't mean you're condoning what they're doing. Did Jesus condone people's sin when he ministered to them? No, he didn't condone their sin, but he still served. There are going to be other churches out there who perhaps worship different than we do. And they're even going to have different beliefs than we do. Maybe beliefs about baptism. Maybe beliefs about the Lord's Supper. Should we, should we separate ourselves from them? Absolutely not. You know why? Because those things are non-essential. On the non-essentials, we ought to come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what denomination they're a part of. And again, there's a difference between religions and denominations. Religions, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about denominations, okay? Religions are Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. No, we should not have anything whatsoever to do can, should we serve a Muslim? Yes. Should we serve a Hindu? Yes. Should we serve a Buddhist? Yes. But should we be a part of their belief system? Absolutely not. But a denomination is another, just another group of Christians who perhaps, like the Methodists or the Presbyterians, are, are we to separate ourselves from the Presbyterians just because they believe in baptizing children, infants and we don't as Baptists? Should we, should we say, you guys are wrong and we've got it all right and so we don't want to have anything to do with you? You're not a part of our clique, so we're not going to help you. We're not going to serve you. Is that the attitude that we should have? Jesus says no. Now, should if there are some people out there who are false teachers. You know how you identify a false teacher? Here it is. I'm going to give it to you real easy. If a, anybody who makes themselves a somebody anyone who makes themselves a somebody ends up proclaiming nobody. But a true preacher sees himself as a nobody and only wants to proclaim the somebody. Stay away from those preachers who want to make themselves a somebody, who want to be seen as rock stars rather than servants of the king. So we should put others first, avoid all prejudice, and realize that no service is too small. Number three, I got to be done. Realize that no service is too small. Jesus says, give a cup of cold water in my name. Cup of cold water in my name. No service is too small. If you just give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, you're serving him. And he says, you'll be rewarded for it. We've talked about Brazil mission trips and vacation Bible school work that we've done in New York City. And we've talked, and some of you say, well, I can't go to Brazil. I can't go there. I can't do all those things. I can't go and help somebody rebuild a porch or roof a house. I, I just can't do that. Can you give a cup of cold water in his name? Can you bake a pie and give it to your neighbor and say, I just ba I'm baking this pie for you in the name of Jesus? Can you do that? Can you write somebody a card and just say, you know what, I'm, I'm just telling you I love you in the name of Jesus. Can you do that? You see, nothing's too small if you do it in the name of Jesus. That's the key. All service done in his name, hear me now, all service done in his name is precious in his sight. You know why it's precious? Because it's in his name. My last point is this. Make sure you're following me. You want to live a life of servant humility. Put others first. Avoid all prejudice. Realize that no service is too small. 
and stay focused on the gospel, number four. Stay focused on the gospel. Now we go back to where we began. If the disciples would have got that right, it would have saved them from a lot of trouble, wouldn't it? That's true for a lot of marriages here today. If you'll just get this part right, it'll save you a lot of trouble. Jesus started off by talking about what? The gospel. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to evil men. They're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise from the dead. And their whole time, they're talking about who's the greatest. What should they have done? They should have stayed focused on the gospel. Is that not the greatest example of humility? The gospel message? Jesus Christ leaving the glories of heaven, being clothed in human flesh, and going to the cross and dying in our place, rising from the dead. If we stay focused on the gospel, we're going to be constantly reminded of humility. As a husband, if I stay focused on the gospel, I'm going to be reminded of the greatest display of humility. And I'm going to, exceed, I'm going to seek to display that humility in my marriage and in my parenting, in my pastoral ministry. The gospel, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, is the greatest display of humility. Let that be your focus. Jesus gave us three examples of servant humility. Humility. He said a child, as we saw here. That's a position of meek and lowliness. But Jesus also gave us a picture of a towel and a basin when he washed the feet of his disciples. But he also gave us the picture of a cross. What's the blessing of being last? Is you'll be honored. And you'll be considered great. In the kingdom of God. If you put others first. And die to yourself. Be willing to put others first. Serve everybody no matter who they are. Or what they look like. What they can do for you. Or what they can't do for you. Realize that nothing is too small. And keep your focus on the gospel. You'll be honored. If you seek to give a cup of cold water to anyone in his name, that's the blessing of being last. Your service will be precious. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. And Lord, we've heard from your word about servanthood, the blessing of being last. And Lord, I pray this morning that you just begin to prick the heart of your people. I pray that all of us would be honest about our own struggle with pride. And I believe that some lives can be turned around today. There are some people here today and they've got strained relationships in their family. Maybe not just with their husband or their wife, but with their brother or sister. A strained relationship with a child. A strained relationship with a co-worker. And for far too long, they've been looking at the other person, what the other person did wrong. This morning, would you look at your own contribution? What have you done wrong? Would you be willing to admit your pride this morning? Would you be willing to come and confess your pride to sin? Would you be willing to kneel down here at this altar and say, Oh God, I've been blaming everybody else. And I can't help what other people are doing, but I can help what I'm doing. And Oh God, I've been prideful. Help me to be a servant. Help me to be a servant to my wife or my husband. Help me to be a servant to my children. Help me to be a servant at my work or at my school. Maybe some youth would say, Lord, I haven't been a servant to my parents. I've been prideful. I've been prideful towards my mom and dad. I've been prideful. But Lord, I want to be a servant. Maybe some of you would say, Lord, I'm guilty of seeking power. I'm guilty of seeking prestige and prominence. I've been jockeying for position." I've bought into the philosophy of the world, but not any longer. I simply want to be your servant. I simply want to honor you. The first step is to be saved. You've got to be willing to die to yourself and take up your cross and follow Christ. You've got to be willing to come and be saved. This morning, he'll save you right where you are if you'll surrender your life to him. 
here in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. The invitation's been clear. Perhaps there are families who need to come, individuals who need to come and pray. If you need to be saved, there will be pastors standing down front. We're here to greet you. You come. Let us minister to you. But whatever God's speaking to your heart about right now, would you respond? Would you be obedient? Heavenly Father, I give this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand right now and begin to come as the Lord leads you come?